Many years ago, one of the worst necrotic lesions that I saw was essentially caused entirely by delayed diagnosis. And this really got me thinking about the problem. In this case, this patient actually told the clinic within three hours that she thought there was something wrong. The clinic then reassured her saying it was normal to feel pain after a procedure. She then rang again later and got a similar reassurance. When blisters started to break out, the same clinician diagnosed her as having cold sores. Eventually the patient was in so much pain that they gave up and went to an accident emergency department where the patient was treated for having a skin infection. All the while, the time to actually have an impact and dissolve the filler that was causing the blockage was slipping away. The thing about this case that really struck me is it was only one small mistake that led to the necrotic injury, putting aside the procedure itself. And it's so easy to avoid if you just think systematically about shrinking the time between blockage and diagnosis. So with that said, let's dive into the warning signs that can help you diagnose your patients quicker. The earliest possible warning sign is simply pain when you inject. For a long time, I've always tried to extract as much information from every vascular occlusion that I come across as a clinician who's supporting others. And in many cases, the first sign was a particularly painful injection. Now this is tricky because all injections hurt a little bit. So you're trying to gauge with a particular patient whether one feels disproportionately uncomfortable for that patient. Now as a result, it's not the most sensitive test but often is quite obvious in retrospect that this injection was different. So my advice would be that if in doubt, if you ever feel that your injection is hurting differently to others on the same patient is to stop, come out, check capillary refill, make sure the patient isn't hemorrhaging from that site, which is another sign that you've gone through a vessel, and then maybe choose a slightly different position for your next injection in the same place. After the initial injection, the next sign is usually pallor. Now, if you get a true, complete vascular occlusion, this is actually very stark, particularly in lips. You'll get a gray patch on the lip that sometimes has zero capillary refill, and it's the most obvious type of vascular occlusion. These are not easily missed in lips, but they are more easily missed in other parts of the face or in patients with darker skin. There is also quite a high degree of false positives. So patients who get a degree of pallor who don't have a vascular occlusion. This happens after lidocaine anesthetic cream is used on the lips where they can become blotchy or the procedure itself can cause blotchiness and this often confuses patients and clinicians into thinking that they have a vascular occlusion. I've noticed over the years that if you look very closely with this type of pallor, the capillary refill is actually still present and within two seconds it's simply paler. So you can compress the lip, recheck and if you see within the heart of the pale area a little bit of capillary refill it's probably just blotchiness from the anesthetic. The other clear sign of this being an issue is that it doesn't fit the path of a blocked artery. So both the top and the bottom lips may look blotchy and it's very unlikely you've occluded both the top and the bottom labial arteries. So you can likely suspect that this is down to the lidocaine effect. The other thing about pallor is that it doesn't last for that long. It's an early sign and it normally gives way into the next sign which is levida reticularis. So this is the net-like pattern, a blotchy purple type rash that is associated with a disruption in the blood drainage of the skin. So the venules might still be taking blood away from the skin, but the arteries are not replacing it. So you have little pale patches next to some darker patches, and this blotchy appearance is associated with larger vascular occlusions, I believe. This is something that usually appears in minutes rather than seconds. So it could be 15 to 30 minutes after the procedure that the blotchiness starts and it is an indication to be seen straight away. The next sign is post-procedure pain. Now this is particularly tricky because post-procedural discomfort is actually quite normal. Most patients will describe an ache or discomfort after a large procedure in most places that they were injected. So what we're looking for here is an area of localized pain that seems much worse than anywhere else. And I would also suggest that if the patient thinks they need strong painkillers to cope with that pain, that this is also something that needs to be seen straight away by the clinician. I've come across several cases where patients were not informed that pain was a particular side effect. They thought it was normal, took painkillers, went to bed and woke up nine hours later with a much progressed vascular injury. I'll never forget coming across this exact situation with one of the worst nose vascular occlusions that I've seen. And this patient believed it was normal to have pain, ended up taking tramadol, going to sleep and waking up the next morning with a far more difficult to treat vascular injury. Another useful concept you might explore with your patients is the difference between discomfort and pain. It's very normal to have some discomfort after a procedure, some tenderness when you push on an area, maybe tenderness when you move or rest your head on a particular area, 
but pain that's building and throbbing in one place is probably not normal and needs to be seen. The next stage of a vascular occlusion is blistering skin. Now this is a notorious confusion within our industry. In fact, famously or rather infamously, there was a salon owner who accused a patient with blisters around her lips of having too much oral sex. What the hell? And maybe that's why she had the problem. I hope that that guy got sued. But this is one of the common mistakes that some clinicians make. So blisters can be caused by herpes, and that is more often a pale blister, whereas when you get a necrotic wound that's breaking down, you get more pustules. So it's a different color. These are, these are more yellowy blisters, and they tend to be in the path of the artery and far less likely to affect the white lip than the pink lip. So if you ever have a patient who complains of blisters coming up after a procedure, double check where it is, get them to send a photograph, and make sure that they are absolutely consistent with the history particularly for that patient of having herpes simplex and not a completely new event with a different colored blister because there you're probably talking about the early stages of skin breakdown. And finally, let me share with you why I believe it's possible to get through an entire career without having a necrotic injury on one of your patients. Now, this is a really interesting thing to think about because if you get everything lined up correctly, the chances of a true necrotic injury happening to your patients, I think, are less than the career risk of it ever happening. Now, you probably will have vascular occlusions. That's different to necrotic injuries. They will occur, but actually having breakdown of tissue, I believe, is avoidable. But you have to think about each stage and minimize the right risks. First, we want to decrease the probability of getting into a vessel. And this is all about those pre-injection steps. Everything from knowing your anatomy, ultrasound, to aspirating, just to decrease the chance of getting the tip of that bevel into the wrong place. Next thing is about what we've talked about today. Diagnose it immediately because that's the best time to diagnose it. So always check your patients before they leave, check a pillary refill and educate them about what to look for. Because the next step is about early triaging. You want to get that patient back in front of you as soon as possible and not let days or hours go by unnecessarily. Next is to diagnose comprehensively. Vascular occlusions are not simple things. You can often, in the heat of the moment, hyper-focus on one area of pala and only realize several hours later that there's another area, often inside the mouth or inside the nose, that is also occluded that you haven't treated. So make sure you think holistically about where a vascular occlusion may have affected the other structures of the face and not just on the area that you first pick up. Next, make sure that you are prepared. You must have the right steps and processes, a protocol that you can have access to so that you can start that process with confidence because you likely haven't seen one for years because that's normally how it works in most good clinics. And you can swing into action, go through the stages and that you've got enough of the product with you to at least get through the first few hours or to cover a standard vascular occlusion. You might also want to be connected with local clinics if you have a short supply of Hylonex or Hyaluronidase and make sure that you can collaborate with clinicians when needed to make sure your patient gets the best treatment. Know also about the other steps that you can take beyond this to reduce the risk. You want to make sure that you know where the hyperbaric oxygen chamber is for your patients and also access to ultrasound, for example. Before we go, let me give you the most powerful, simplest and cheapest way that you can quickly pick up vascular occlusions. And it's simply to check capillary refill on everyone during your procedure, not just at the end, but as you're injecting, Whenever I'm cleaning the skin and making sure there's no blood in it, I'm also checking for the capillary refill to bounce back quickly. This is one of the easiest ways to diagnose people quickly. In my clinic, Skin Viva, over the course of 15 years, I think between eight clinicians, we've had about 17 vascular occlusions. All of them have been picked up immediately on the day that the patient was treated and therefore treated comprehensively and no one ended up with a necrotic wound. So this is what I hope for everyone watching this show. Finally, it's really important to teach your patients about these things. I know in many parts of the world, it's considered not normal to tell your patients about vascular occlusion. And this is surprising to many of us, but also it's a, based on a false idea, which is that patients will not have the procedure if they find out that there is danger. Really what they're looking for is someone that they trust. And if you convey confidence and certainty in the way you describe a vascular occlusion, how you will avoid it and what you will do if they do happen, you will have more patients than the average clinician because you're the one who can handle the risk. So make sure you teach your patients and do it in such a way as that they believe in you and that you are really fully prepared. It's not just about scaring them, it's about leading them away from that potential fear so that they know they're in the right place in a good clinic with someone who can look after them.
So I hope that video has helped you. We discussed how to diagnose a vascular occlusion as early as possible and the importance for doing that and how I believe if you do this in conjunction with some of the other things we've mentioned, you could get through a whole career without ever causing a necrotic injury on your patients. If you want to learn more about safety, particularly if you want to review that case study on the vascular occlusion in an earlobe, or you want to learn more about safety when injecting lips, make sure you click on these videos here.